Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tandazani Lakama, and I'm an assistant curator here at Zeitzmarker. I'm going to introduce our esteemed guest, after which we will watch a short video about his practice before handing over to our executive director and chief curator, Koyo Kuo. Zeitzmarker is proud to host a conversation with Yinka Shonibare, CBERA, an artist who has made transformative contributions to the art canon. There is an entire generation of artists and art practitioners hailing from multiple geographies who confidently navigate the world free from reductive limits on their practice. To a large extent, I think we can all agree that this is mainly thanks to the pioneer, to pioneering artists such as Yinka Shonibare, who from the late 80s was already refuting imposed notions of what it meant to be African or from Africa, and boldly positioning himself as a citizen of the world. From then on, Shonibare would give us all the articulation and imagination to engage the world on our own terms using our own limitless tools. His use of wide-ranging mediums tends to be underpinned by the theatrical. He has used film, photography, painting, sculpture, and several other mediums in whimsical, satirical ways to deconstruct and complicate power relations as well as ideas around authorship. Shonibare boldly destabilizes linear narratives, carrying his audiences into utopian spaces in which notions of multiplicity and hybridity are more pronounced. Shonibare has been described by some historians as one who redresses history, literally often using fabric, but drawing from literature, film, theater, history, Shonibare's practice has a powerful way of continuously interrogating questions around authenticity, class, Africanness, or blackness. He looks at the decadence, fri frivolity, and excess and drama of the 18th century uh, European aristocrats and creates an other or an outsider who shakes up the establishment. He has mastered a myriad ways to highlight the entangled histories between Africa and Europe, particularly the understated syncretism, tensions, and contradictions that have emerged across time and space. Creating space and giving voice to the next generation is something that is vit of vital importance to Shonibari. We see this in how he has recently established platforms for young artists in Lagos and in London. Shonibari has timelessly, tirelessly supported the development of early career and African diaspora artists through guest projects founded in 2006. The artist res this artist residency program has offered early career multidisciplinary creatives and practitioners free access to a project space in which to collaborate and experiment for one month at a time. The studio encompassing the ground floor of a former carpet factory in East London was an alternative universe and playground for artists, performers and curators encouraging them to collaborate and make new and experimental work. Over the years, it evolved to become a laboratory of ideas and a testing ground for new thoughts and actions in which the possibility of failure became an opportunity for artistic growth. The guest artist space, GAS Foundation, in Nigeria was established in 2019 and uh, 2022 and is supported by the Yinka Shonibare Foundation in the UK, Gas Foundation. 
It is a nonprofit dedicated to facilitating international cultural exchange, developing creative and research practices through residencies and collaborations. The space is about giving practitioners and academics the space to research, experiment, share, educate, and develop work. Shonibari has been twice nominated for the Turner Prize in 2004 and in 2008. His numerous awards include the eighth recipient of the White Chapel Gallery Art Icon Award, London, 2021, the Robson Orr 1010 Award, London, 2020, the African Arts Award, National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian Institute, USA, 2016, to name a few. In, 2020, in 2013, he was elected a royal academician and was awarded the honor of the commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2019. Shonibari is no stranger to Zeitzmacher. His film, Adio del Passato 2011, was part of Zeitzmacher's inaugural exhibition in 2017, and the sculptural installation, Adam and Eve 2013, was part of our Still Here Tomorrow to High Five You Yesterday in 2019. It is an absolute pleasure to host him today for a conversation with our executive director and chief curator, Koyo Kuo. Thank you. So the way that I make my work is that I start from sketches or I also start from research. Uh, if there are issues I'm particularly concerned about, then look for ways of representing those but then the actual um, making of them, I have a studio in which I work with different craftspeople. I work with costumiers and sculptors and so on. And then so I design uh, what I want made and then I have design meetings with the various people who might make different parts of the project. The acquisition of my work, line painting by the Arts Council came at a very good time in my career. It was very useful. Plus, of course, I, I, I could do with the money as well. That, that was, you know, that was good. That kind of validation is very um, important for a young artist because you're being encouraged to, um, you know, continue doing what you're doing. And you know that it's a good collection. The work will be looked after. I mean, some private collectors, of course, do look after the work, but uh, you know that something like the Arts Council will support you and uh, and look after the work you know for a longer period of time i'm very glad that the arts council have come back uh to collect another piece the crowning is actually it's a political work it's visually seductive and very beautiful but it's really about what we're going through in the world at the moment because that piece is a parody of the, what was happening actually in France in the 18th century. And the, the crowning is actually based on a painting by the French artist Fragona, a Rococo artist. The thing about the sculpture, they don't have heads. And that was also a joke about the kind of, you know, the excesses just before the French Revolution and the way the French aristocracy lost their heads to the guillotine. Often I like paradox in my work. On the one hand, there's the desire for the beauty of the work, but then there's a degree of darkness behind that beautiful facade. At the time that work was made, people were really concerned about the gap between the rich and the poor. And even more so today, you know, the billionaires and so on, and then there are people who can have hardly afford housing. When I was at college here, you know, I had a lot of interest in international politics, and I basically was making work at that time about what was going on in Russia at Perestroika. And one of my teachers said, but well, you're of African origin, aren't you? Why aren't you producing authentic African art? And it, it was actually at that point 
I started to use the fabric in my work because I felt that the story of the fabric is very interesting. I always thought the fabrics were authentically African and then I realized that actually the fabric has a complex history, which is, you know, Indonesian Dutch and then, you know, Africa as well. So it's about the construction of stereotypes primarily. That's why I started using the fabrics because the fabrics for me, uh, they've become a symbol of the, cons the myths that we construct for ourselves. Good morning, my name is Koyo, and uh, it's a great, great pleasure to be here to have this conversation with Yinka. Good morning, Yinka. Thanks for coming. And um, it's an amazing pleasure for me to be here, and we are going straight to the first slide. I think that it's always interesting and nice, actually, to, uh, in a conversation like this, to uh, go to the origins of uh, how people meet and how people get to know each other. I put this, uh, this slide together because, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, reading the contemporary, African art from theory to marketplace, uh, which is one of the first kind of, for me, serious uh, uh, critical material that I got to know about African art, of course, produced by our dear Okui and, uh, and the Lou in 1999. And I remember my copy has a, has a special dedicate, dedic do you call it a dedicate? Dedication. Dedication. Yeah. dedication uh, by Okui, and, uh, and you're on the cover, and that's why I, how I got aware of your work in 1999. And, uh, and I, was, I was, of course, intrigued by that picture and by that gentleman uh, in the middle of uh, this scenery of uh, 19th century or 18th century could be Britain, could be US, could be anywhere in the Western world. Um, and the second time, of course, uh, was uh, contemporary African art since 1980, Okui again with uh, Chica this time. And again, you are on the cover of the, of the publication. And this time with a work that I found just as intriguing as uh, the other one, which is Sleep of Reason. And uh, yeah, I uh, maybe to, to begin with, I wanted to ask you, what is your relationship with these two covers? Well, um, you know, when I, um, first of all, just to tell you the reason I started to actually look at um, the idea of deconstructing um, the, the Western canon of art. There were many stereotypes when I went to college, and there was a certain kind of work expected from Africans, and whenever Africans actually made work that looked um, a bit Western, the work is usually described. I mean, I would say Western in inverted commas anyway but the work is usually described as derivative. And also, you know, a number of Western artists were kind of um, appropriating African art. But for some reason, Africans were meant to have some kind of limits on where they could go or what, could, what they could be inspired by. And at the time, of course, we were all reading, you know, we were all reading Derrida, Lacan, Baudrillard, um, Roland Bath. So the whole idea of deconstruction um, was actually quite a big thing then. And so I decided then to start to deconstruct the Western canon of art. And, and of course, you know, a lot of um, writers were very interested in my work. And Okwi and Wezo, you know, was particularly interested in my work and Olu Ogwebe. And so I guess when they created the um, you know, that text of the book, 
Uh, and you know, I'd been working with them as well, and they felt that they, they wanted to put me on the cover. And, um, and of course, you know, I, so that work, the one with the, um, you know, the Victorian one, I actually made that work as an intervention on the London Underground in London. So there were like more than about 40 posters on the London Underground. I mean, now you do see art on the London Underground, but at that time, it wasn't done. I mean, nobody was doing that. So I decided to actually do something where really on the platform, as you were waiting for the tube, you would see this huge poster. And um, that was, I would say that was my kind of first public art, but it was kind of a you know, big intervention, about 40 stations, as I said. And then, um, and then the other one, the Goya image, uh, the sleep of reason produces monster. I mean, I'm a fan of uh, Goya anyway, because he was very critical of the aristocracy. He also made work about the horrors of war. And at the time, I think um, there was, there might have been the Iraq war. And I was actually thinking about literally the sleep of reason produces monsters. <coughs> And then I went to the Goya image, and then you know, I, I did a, a series of photographs. Thank you so much. I would like to to go to the to the next slide and dip a little bit deeper into exactly Diary of a Victorian Dandy, which is a work of 1980, 1998. And uh, as you said, it's a series of five photographs depicting yourself playing the role of a dandy. And uh, the series of tableaux shows this uh, very pretentious status conscious figure who seeks acceptance in an aristocratic milieu and at different times of the day. So we have here three, uh, uh, three o'clock in the morning, I guess, 11 in the morning. And um, there is a, there are, uh, 2 p.m. and uh, 5 p.m kind of uh, a sequence of uh, activity in the life of, uh, of a dandy. The work demonstrates uh, your identification somewhat to the dandy as an outsider, so to speak, or a foreigner who uses this flamboyance and wit and style to penetrate the highest levels of, uh, of society, which otherwise would be, would be close to him. Uh, I think the work is powerful in its parody of uh, of your own life in a, as a creative uh, black British artist. And uh, it alludes also to a black aspirational designer generation, so to speak, I think. And uh, can, you, can you walk us through, because when I look at this work, and I have been fascinated and intrigued by this work since, ever since I, I met it over in, at the, on the cover of this publication, uh, what I ask myself is, this is like a performative or a durational performative project that is captured in a few photographs. But the whole performativity, I mean, I can imagine, can you talk us through it? How it did it start? How, I mean, the execution of it, because I think that it is, it took more time than it seems. Yes, well, so um, first of all, um, the main reason, if you can imagine, imagine, take yourself back to 1998. You see, now we're so used to prominent works of black artists, right? You know, Ke Kerry James Marshall, you know, there's all these artists are in the media. Take yourself back to 1998, and then take yourself back to my college days, when not even a single black professor or artist came into my college, right? So I had no uh, role models as such. They were there, but I was not taught about them. So a lot of the artists who looked like me that I, I knew about, I found out about myself, really, after my education. So I wanted to, and then, I was reading things like, you know, uh, critical texts, you know, and I was reading thought texts and a number of publications. But I was also reading, seeing the works of a lot of artists of African origin, which quite legitimately, they were making work 
you know, the people were angry because of the situation. Uh, there was a lot of kind of protest art. Um, there was a lot of agitation. And as a black artist, I was expected to be angry, to be protesting, to be... And I felt that, no, actually, you know what? I'm actually not going to do that because that's what you want from me. I'm going to be, do luxurious work. I'm going to show work enjoying myself. I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to get into your s space, and, but I'm not going to get in your space as a subservient black man. I'm going to be at the center and you are going to serve me and I'm going to be the dandy. And I'm, So it was a kind of a, a radical way and a deliberate parody, but of course I wanted to do this through Hogarth's Rick's progress, because I was also very interested in Hogarth as well. And I was interested in Hogarth's parody of the British aristocracy because his parents actually ended up in a debtor's prison. And so he made a lot of kind of works parodying the British aristocracy and literally just making fun of them. And so I was uh, very interested in that. I was equally interested in, I was reading the works of Oscar Wilde at the time. And Oscar Wilde's, you know, Dorian Gray, you know, which I, I made, uh, I made something uh, based on that. Um, so, and of course, to make this work, I took over, um, you know, a British aristocrat's estate. And so, and I went there with actors and we stayed there for about three days and we just had fun shooting this, uh, you know, shooting this. Um, and it was a fun thing to do as well, you know, to dress up and to transform and to change myself. And so this was, this was actually enjoyable protest art. And I was also determined that the work was going to be accessible. So it wasn't just going to be in a gallery. It was going to be, so I approached INIVA, Institute of International Visual Arts, and I gave them this idea and, you know, as a young artist, I was extremely confident then. Um, it was going to cost, I think it was definitely going to cost nearly £100,000 to make this whole project. And I just went there with confidence and I just said, well, you're going to give me money and I'm going to make this, you know, and I'm going to make this big project. And I think they were actually quite shocked and surprised. I had the audacity to do this. And they said, okay, look, uh, we are going to raise the money for you to do it. And so they supported me, and I did, I did this project. So that was the whole process. That's amazing. I think that uh, it's a work. I mean, you, you, you said something quite interesting when you said that you found out about yourself after your education. And, and I think it's a very much telling of uh, professionals of, uh, of our generation, I have to say, that we went to uh, uh, educational cycles where we were thirsty for certain things about ourselves that we didn't find and that the lack of finding ourselves or seeing ourselves propelled us or pushed us to do things in order to see ourselves in many ways. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, I think that uh, uh, you, you just spoke about uh, Dorian Gray, which is actually uh, the next work that uh, I would like to uh, talk about. and. Uh, this is a part. Uh, this is part of a series of twelve photographs, uh, Im uh, photographic images that explore narcissism. So, uh, takes it. It takes its title also from uh, from Oscar, Oscar Wilde, the picture of Dorian Gray, and it tells the story of a handsome young man who forfeits his soul in order to remain forever young while a hidden portrait captures the effects of his age and increasing moral corruption. So a simple way to understand the novel is that Dorian switches identities with his portrait, and he remains young while the paintings registers his vice and ages in his stead, a kind of proxy to, to for the self, so to speak. So in effect, Dorian is a man who looks perfect on the outside, but evil within. So this series of 12 images presents a narrative sequence that formally replicates both the novel of uh, 
1945 Albert Lewin directed film of the same title. Um, can you talk us a little bit more to your, your version of Dorian Gray? So, um, this is actually the first time I've directly made work that's connected to ideas around the body and disability and mortality. So, you know, I mean, I got a virus in my spine when I was 19, uh, which left me, you know, completely paralyzed. And I, and out of that, you know, I kind of managed to get back into my art. And then, you know, I started making work, which in, in many ways was kind of, you know, very good, very liberating, but I never actually looked talked about ideas of the body in my work or notions of the body or even ideas around mortality in my work. But I didn't want to do that in a literal way. And I, and then I, of course, I'd read uh, the picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. And, but then at the same time, also looking at society. So we live in a society where there's a kind of um, there's a kind of vanity about the body and there's sort of plastic surgery, uh, skin lightening, you know, all the various things we do to our bodies. Uh, and so I decided then to look at this story. This story is about somebody who wants to stay young forever, um, you know, kind of made a pact with the, with the devil, as it were, to remain young. And um, and so, you know, I go through that story of the picture of Dorian Gray and his, his, uh, that process of um, trying to retain his youth when indeed he was actually, you know, getting older and um, but not coming to terms with that idea. And so, but th and then the way to do this is to actually take so there was, I took stills from um, a film about uh, the picture of Dorian Gray and then reconstructed every sequence in that film. And so they're kind of re reconstructed from stills. And so that's what you, you see here. So he looks at himself in the mirror. Uh, he, goes to, uh, he goes to a party and, uh, and then um, he meets with the guy who kind of corrupts him, Basil Howard, I, I think his name is. Um, and eventually he, um, he kills his friend, he stabs him. And, um, and then eventually he looked at where he, there was a mirror um, hidden uh, within his house, I think. And he went to have a look in there and then he saw the dark side of his character. And then eventually, um, you know, he dies. And then when he died, um, his face kind of got really old to his real age. And um, so that's kind of the story in a, in a nutshell. But the, but the main point of this series is to actually explore uh, notions of mortality and the body. It's interesting how, you know, everyone, of course, reads the work in a different way. When I was, when I first uh, came across Dorian Gray and uh, started to try to understand the work and without reading it, because I, I do it often, I don't necessarily want to read uh, what is written about the work, but yeah, yeah. engage with the work itself in order to sort of appropriate it for myself in yeah, a way. Yeah. And uh, looking at it, looking at Dorian Gray to the little knowledge that by then I had about your practice, I, I sort of, s and, and the way that you use allegories a lot in yeah. a, as, a, as, a, as a form, actually, yeah. I, I, I sort of started to see that this is also another allegory, actually, of the Western world, so to speak. You know mm -hmm. the, the 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 vanity and the the the, the obsession with youth. You yeah, know yeah, the yeah, obsession yeah. with uh, narcissism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the the betrayals. 
yeah, yeah. The yeah. the greed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's all know? it's all there, you know. Yeah. In that, all of those things are all there in the series, um, you know. Especially this kind of, you know, obsession with the body, you know, which is also linked to vanity, of course, and, and narcissism, you know, uh, which is very much a trait of kind of Western culture that we're kind of going in that direction. And and I, I also see it as a as another as another way of you to really put back the mirror to the to uh, let me say let me say British culture because this is where you you live the most in in ways in which uh, the entire British history has has uh, has uh, has behaved in the world so to speak so what do no you well I mean I think that. It's actually impossible to be an African speaking English to you now without the legacy of, of the colonial in the background. Because actually my preferred language to speak to you guys would be Yoruba. But of course, you're not going to understand me if I speak Yoruba to you. So, but that in a sense, living in the UK and speaking English is a legacy of colonialism. And that, and that legacy of colonialism, of course, has a lot to do with one's identity. And a sort of hybrid identity is created because of that colonial encounter. And so whether I choose to acknowledge that or not, it's always present. And so in a way, for me anyway, there is no escape in dealing with this issue. That is so clear, and uh, yeah. I think also if I c would like to address the, the the idea and the notion of narcissism, yeah. in uh, that is so embedded in this work, and uh, the ways in which you know, I mean, I think that uh, all cultures and all societies, uh, of course, narcissism is something that is extremely present in uh, in all societies, but. The ways in which uh, the colonial enterprise, particularly, has exacerbated and propagated the idea of narcissism and the idea of uh, uh, canons of beauty and establishing what is what is exactly. beautiful and what is not beautiful exactly, yeah. is is uh, is on parallel in many ways. So, yeah, do you yeah. have something to say about that? Well, I mean, I think that again, you know. It goes back to what I was saying about the body again. And the body, you know, I think it was uh, Barbara Kruger got that work which says, you know, the body is a battleground. And I think that, you know, standards of beauty are kind of established by the West. And we do everything to change ourselves, um, you know, to change our hair, uh, we lighten our skin. Uh, we do all this, and all of this is the legacy, if you like, of colonialism. And who is deciding what's beautiful or not beautiful? And, um, you know, and in a, in a way, all of those things are actually linked to the essence of, uh, you know, Dorian Gray, that project as a whole. Um, you know, so, and then, you know, how, how does one actually address that or start to to readdress that or change that, um, you know. And um, I mean, even kind of personally for myself as well, you know, that's why I actually decided to grow my locks because I was like, well, you know, I'm just gonna have my hair natural. And so all these things are kind of political, um, you know, uh, and um, yes, I think that's, you know, what I have to say about that. Uh, a series of work. I mean, I call it a, the I call it the driptych of knowledge, so to speak. These are the libraries uh, uh, projects. There are three. There is the American Library, which is, and there is the African Library, and there is uh, the British Library. Uh, and uh, here we have, yeah, in the in the. British Library is an installation of 6,328 
hardback books individu individually covered in color, colorful Dutch wax print, and uh, arranged in row on rows of shelving. Names are printed in gold leaf on the spines of 2,700 of the books, the majority of which are, are uh, of first or second generation immigrants to Britain, both celebrated and lesser known, who have made significant contributions to the British culture. Whereas the African Library is a, is a piece of installation art created in 2018 based on your previous successful works on the British Library and the American Library. It features books wrapped in Dutch wax as well and with uh, names of prominent Africans on the spines. And uh, the American Library uh, is, uh, is a work in the same manner uh, with countless of, uh, of, uh, of hard books covered in Dutch wax. And uh, here you, you highlight the works of poets, philosophers, and historians with ancestral connections to the Great Migration and uh, the movement of six million black Americans from rural southern US that occurred between 1910s and the 1970s. I think that these are monumental sculptures. These are sculptures of uh, knowledge and knowledge as an artistic material. Can you speak a bit about that, about uh, the, the divide that you make between the content of the American Library, the focus that you made there on the Great Migration, the focus that you made in the British Library about sort of erasure and absence, I see, and the focus that you made about uh, in the African Library about what I see is about reclaim or reclamation or reappropriation of of our thinkers and and uh, and you know politicians and so on. So, how does that that is like a triangular? a uh, system of re-establishing knowledge or re-imprinting knowledge into the consciousness, and uh, yeah. Well, um, first of all, I think that there is a, um, there is a kind of politics of forgetting, or politics of amnesia, and um, there are, see, a lot of these works, it's no, co it's no coincidence that a lot of the, the works developed at a time when the world was changing dramatically. So in the 60s, we had the civil rights movement. Uh, we had uh, feminism. And we then, you know, coming into the 2000s, um, it seems to me that the, all of these gains were being kind of reversed. So, and then, you know, the library or the form of the library is a receptacle, if you like, for memory. It's a, it's a memory, um, it's, a, it's a memory bank, or you can put it that way. And I decided that, you know, many of these things that we're forgetting uh, many of the rights that we're forgetting, um, you know, I needed to somehow explore that in a work and to go through this archive, you know, um, to go through these archives of knowledge in a way and actually explore them. So, for example, within the British Library, that was, that was a time when there was a lot of xenophobia uh, within the UK and people were talking about Brexit and wanting to come out of Europe. Um, some Eastern European people were being attacked. And, th and I couldn't understand this rise in, in xenophobia because then I started to actually think about Britain itself. And then I thought, oh, actually, 
the royal family. They have their origins in Germany. Um, you know, many famous people, Helen Mirren, you know, family in Russia. So there are many iconic uh, British names whose families actually came from elsewhere, but they're, they're considered very British. So um, to explore that, I decided to actually create this library of significant immigrants uh, who are very much part of British culture now. And, you know, so in a way, as I described, it as a kind of memory archive or, you know, um, so I then, you can go on the, there are some computers which kind of give you more information about the people, and then you've got their names on the spine. And this work was actually acquired by uh, Tate, and it's installed at Tate Modern. Um, you know, it, I mean, I, the exhibition will be on for a while, but it's been on for a couple of years now. And, and also, it was, people could, because they were not just libraries, it was kind of interactive as well. So there's a website called the British Library Installation.com, and people could actually write the stories of their own families. Where they, so there would be many visitors to the museum, and they would say, oh, you know, my grandfather came from you know, Germany after the Second World War, and they would write the stories of what happened. And I also found the fact that this was a sort of active archive as well. Um, it was actually also another uh, very interesting part. And then with the African Library, I was also thinking about, you know, you mentioned like erasure, you know, the, the fact that actually there are many African philosophers, writers, uh, people within politics, music, who've made a significant contribution to global culture, uh, but never acknowledged in that way. So I wanted to create this archive, and it would, it's almost like a sort of, and some of the books are, have no text on them. And that's to suggest that actually those contributions are active and continuing and you know so it's a kind of endless open-ended endless um, ongoing contribution to knowledge and for very strange reasons which I don't understand um, African contribution to global culture is never as celebrated or as acknowledged uh, you know so that's the purpose of that library. So it's a, it's a kind of engagement with one's history and also continuing culture, uh, if you like. And then the American Library, again, you know, um, Donald Trump was talking about building a wall and, um, and also not quite, I mean, of course, America anyway is a nation of immigrants and then the, um, the migration from the south to the north of the African-American community, which was also a significant period within African history. And many of those uh, migrants, if you like, quote unquote, also made, made significant contributions to American culture generally. And so in a way, I also wanted to celebrate them. And so that's what that library, uh, the American library is about. No, there is no space. <laughs> to, uh, to present them no, and, and also just to say that also this work was, uh, I mean, I literally had a, a huge team of researchers working on this project. So it's a thoroughly well researched and big, big project. Yeah. Which is also uh, a kind of, uh, uh, how do you say it, uh, uh, the way you work, you know. It's very much research based, it's very much collaboration reliant in terms of uh, the different expertise that you, that you draw and bring into your work. Can you talk about that collaboration and how you build or you draw 
from the different kind of uh, expertise and practices to bring in into your work? Yes, well, I mean, I think that I'm generally very interested in um, culture. But when I say I'm interested in culture, I mean that in the broader sense. So that includes material culture, that includes knowledge, that includes craft, that includes all kinds of skills. And so, and the way that I do that is, I, well, I guess I consider myself as a kind of conductor of an orchestra. You know, it's more like conducting an orchestra or the way you might think of an architect's office or something. Uh, so in my studio, I've got researchers, I've got costumiers, um, painters, um, y you know, so... It's like a Renaissance artist. <laughs> well, in, well in, a, in, in, a, in a way. So, and then what I do is I have design meetings with my production team. And then from the design meetings, then that the second level, then we go to the, to the actual makers. But then we also have researchers as well. Uh, where we actually research something. But it's very important to me that somehow the work should never look like research. You know, it's important that it, it's an the research is an integral part of the actual work because the, the material and the aesthetic is just as important to me as the content. I mean, this is what is so striking about your work, that form has mm. a, a central role and a very important role. But at the same time, it's not the most important, actually. You yeah, manage yeah. to elevate, I mean, not elevate, you manage to use form in ways that gives it a drive, but at the same time, a ways that gives it also like a, a side or how can I say it in proper English, that it's not over, overbearing. So form as a vehicle. So if the form is the vehicle that kind of houses the ideas, what is the motor? What is the? The, the motor, like uh, the engine. Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, first of all, you have to have, you know, the most important, I think the most important aspect of my work actually is paradox. You know, because I'm not a, uh, I don't like to produce didactic work. You know, so that I don't, you know, I actually don't want you to, to know my political views. It's, it's very difficult to hide through your work. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly through the materials that you use. I mean, I'll get to talk about the Dutch wax later, but I'd like you to elaborate more on the engine because I see form as a container. Yeah. So if form is a container, what is the driver? What is the engine? Well, I mean, I, I think it's more about ambivalence for me, really. It's about, okay, look, what I'm doing is I'm giving you a set of propositions, right? So as the audience, I think it was Brecht who said that the audience complete the work. It's up to the audience to actually complete the work. So you, the audience, will complete the work. It's not, I don't, I start with what I put in front of you. I, pro I give you a series of propositions and it's up to you to decide because, I mean, a good way to, dis to explain that is in, in the British Library, for example, which is a, um, a celebration of immigrants who've made huge contributions to Britain. But then within the same library, you also have the list of people who are kind of extremely right wing and do not like foreigners. And you kind of wonder why, why are they included? Because it's absolutely shocking to find their names there. But actually, you know, I'm giving you a series of propositions and it's up to you to, to kind of complete that and decide. I mean, uh, your work is so uh, drenched in what I call the digestion of colonialism somehow, and in ways in which that this enterprise has shaped all of us, regardless on which side of the fence that you find yourself. 
and uh, and also in ways in which that the aftermath of that enterprise are enduring and uh, still shaping our present and continue to uh, uh, fundamentally or, uh, order our relationships. When I say our, I've, I'm talking about the whole humanity. And that's why I say, I talk, also talk about on which side of the fence that you find yourself around the, the heritage and legacy of, uh, of colonialism. And I'm um, speaking it, sitting in, in Cape Town with you in, uh, on a ground that is uh, very, very uh, uh, marked by the, the, the colonial enterprise. So uh, I'd like to sort of get to, you know, how, the, how that experience is is uh, uh, shaped your ideas, and how does that flow of ideas actually lead to execution, leads to selection of materiality, selection of the making, and how all this energy is uh, is channeled towards making a work. I'm asking it because I'm fundamentally, basically, only interested in the making of the work, not necessarily in the work at, uh, uh, itself. So the process of developing an idea, the process of selecting material, the process of even, you know, orchestrating all the inputs that comes into a work is very interesting. I mean, I think that, you know, Politics happens daily, right? And you know that people are affected by that. You know, you can see the disparities. You can see, you can understand that, for example, there are many, many more, in terms of proportion, there are many, many more black people in prison, right? For example, in the West and also in the United States, right? And you can also see the housing disparities and the health outcomes. So we're kind of surrounded by the legacy of inequality right, and by the legacy of colonialism. But you have to, there's a process. So do you, you know, of course you, I'm an artist, so I have certain tools available to me to not necessarily because I'm an artist, but I'm not a preacher. You know, I, you know, it's it's a you preach in your own way. <laughs> well, it's a completely different. So the way available to me is a process of exploration to actually try to understand the world the way it is. But then I I use certain strategies, and that's yes, you know, that is the process of actually creating art, which you know, in a sense, it could also be. It could also be therapeutic, actually. It could be a way to, to retain a sense of the world or to try and understand it. But we understand that through, through the development and engagement with, with work, with making. And, but then to actually make, you then have to engage with science and representation. You know, and then you engage through so that again, that's engaging semiotics, you know, the study of science or the study of, and what do you use? What materials do you actually use uh, to get close to the exploration of your thoughts? And then, of course, I like to use, going back to the African textiles, the reason I continue to use that, and I find that so fascinating, is that it manages to be African and non-African at the same time. And that's very, very interesting to me. That's something that was Indonesian inspired, produced by the Dutch, then also appropriated by Africans and then claimed by Africans. But you know the whole story. Yes, the real, yes. The, you know that the whole story has, of course, the economical part of it. And and the fact that I mean I am I'm also fascinated by those uh, by the I don't call them African fabrics anymore I call them Dutch fabrics yeah, so yeah. Uh, 
the the very fact that um, uh, the the Flisco, yeah, uh, the the Dutch um, fabric uh, producer in the mid nineteenth century, yeah, uh, colonizing Indonesia, yes, of uh, course. they wanted to to redo the Java prints. Exactly, yeah. The Java batiks, yes. which was worn, a fabric produced by Indonesian, worn by the aristocracy in Indonesia, and the Dutch wanted to make a market out of it. Yes. So they developed a system to reproduce those fabrics, but it was never as good as what exactly. the traditional Indonesian want. So the Indonesian rejected it, they didn't yeah. buy it. Yes. So through their routes from Europe to Indonesia, of course, to stop at all our coast, and our people loved it. Yes. And that's how they it was appropriated. Yes. It was a. It was a. It, I mean, a lot of people don't know this history, and up to today, uh, it has become a genuinely. African feature, so to speak, and I, and I, and I would like to speak to you. I mean, to get your take on this this sense of appropriation. For somehow, I think that yes, it's important to know the origin of uh, of this uh, of this product and of this trade. But at the same time, that level of appropriation that it has gained on the continent, and also that level of recognition and association. Uh, with Africa is quite interesting. Well, I mean, I think that those fabrics are, they are, they are African. You know, they, they are African in the sense that, you know, Africans have made it African, you know, so they're, they're, they're very definitely African and they're very definitely not African, you know. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's very interesting to me because um, why not? You know, if they, if people say they're African, they are African. You know, if an African feels that they are African, they are African. Um, and um, so, because you know, we. I mean, there's that famous Magritte painting which says, uh, you know, there's a picture of a pipe, but under the pipe it says, "This is not a pipe." Now, of course, we agree that a bit of paint and uh, drawing is actually not a pipe, right? It's not a pipe. It's, it's paper and paint. It's, it's a picture. It's, but it's a drawing of a pipe, right? But we agree that it's a pipe because we agree that right? this is what a pipe looks like on paper. But, so it's only a pipe because of consensus. We agree. But actually, somebody, if you bring somebody from a faraway tribe, they might just look at that picture and don't know what you're talking about. So for them, that's actually not a pipe. Do you understand? Yeah, so yeah. if Africans say the fabric is African, then it's African. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I, I agree <laughs> with that. But it's interesting, it's interesting uh, to speak about this in a time where there is a heightened uh, conversation about appropriation, association, who's allowed to speak about what, who's allowed to own what, who's allowed to represent yeah, what. Exactly. I think it, yeah. in that context it becomes absolutely very political. I mean, it has never lost its kind of charge of, uh, of, uh, of politicality, if you guys say that in English. And, uh, but in a context like today, I think it becomes even more interesting to, to look at it through, through that lens. Yes, but the important thing is to never put limits on the extent to which Africans can appropriate, you know. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, before we move to, uh, I would like to move to your work as a, as a curator as a, as a arts organization founder and leader, and uh, the guest projects first in London that are part of your studio, and it's an extension of your 
openness and generosity to provide space for younger artists or for other artists in general, not necessarily young or old, but for other artists to, uh, to have space to express themselves and to share your space, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so um, in 2008, I acquired, I got a, a, a warehouse space in London. That's also my studio now, but I also have a gallery downstairs. It was a time when, because when my career started with other artists, we used to take over, um, you know, empty buildings in London. Uh, the economy was quite bad and we used to, and so the whole, I mean, I'm sure you've heard about the YBAs, you know, young British artists. And so a lot of my generation, there was a recession including, you know, people like, of course, Damien Hoss, you, you've heard of. Uh, we all used to take over these spaces and make projects there. And then somehow the economy recovered and many young artists uh, couldn't find sort of, you know, empty spaces to, to experiment and to work. And so I decided I would provide that in my studio space. And but the market was really starting then to get really big all the various art fairs and biennales were just springing up everywhere. And so artists were kind of feeling the pressure that they had to have a gallery and they have to be like really commercial. But of course, you don't start off being commercial. You know, you need time to, um, to explore and experiment. So I provided that platform and I would give space to artists for a month and artists could do anything. And the important thing for me was that artists actually had a space to fail. Because, you know, the, the idea that you actually have a space to fail and you don't feel commercial pressure and the whole prioritizing actually the process of making seemed, you know, like a really important thing to, to develop an artist, uh, to develop practice. So, and that's what I did. So I did that for, there was a, a proposal box outside the space and artists would drop proposals into the box and then I'd select, you know, the best projects. And I wanted to create a kind of egalitarian system where it wasn't about nepotism or who you knew, or so it was like completely random. And it was also very important that it was multidisciplinary. So there was dance, performance, and I did that for about 11 years. And then, actually, it was v BC Silver who invited me to Lagos. And so BC Silver invited me to Lagos to do a talk. And of course, you know, my family, I've got family in Lagos. And I went to Lagos and did a talk there. And then the room was absolutely packed, people everywhere. And I realized that actually people were kind of hungry for for a platform, you know, an international platform and conversation about art. And I met a lot of kind of young artists and I decided to, well, for the first idea was to try and build uh, a museum of contemporary art. And then I, I realized in my, I got a, I commissioned a report on the art scene there. And I realized that, okay, even if the space was built, who, is going, who are the people who are going to be the curators, who are going to be the conservationists, who are going to be... So I realized that actually, no, I had to go kind of grassroots. And then I decided the, on the idea of an artist residency space. Uh, but the artist residency, so uh, those pictures, was when I went to Lagos to meet some artists to talk to them about what I wanted to do, because I wanted to involve the artists from the outset, even before we built anything, and have conversations with them. And then, so I then built this uh, residency space with uh, three bedrooms for artists and a gallery space downstairs, but it's in two parts. So that's the building um, that we, it was, it's not quite finished there, but it was um, kind of being built. And so we have, you know, three bedrooms for artists. We have a space for, for where artists can show and make work. 
And then it's in two parts as well. We also have a farm. And we have a 54-acre farm about two hours out of the city. And we built a... So that's the space in Lagos. Um, and that's the courtyard. There's a performance courtyard, and then there's a, there's a gallery. Um, and uh, so on the farm, we also... Yeah, that's the farm. And an architect kind of excavated the soil, and we created about 40,000 bricks that we used to build uh, this building. And uh, so and on the farm, we grow different crops, you know, tomatoes, cassava. Uh, that's me going on the farm, talking with the, the kind of launch and meeting with the lo local chiefs and everything. And that's the farm. And art, uh, many artists are also interested in producing artworks around the environment and ecology, and they will be able to use that space. And we will have studios on the farm as well. We're building some studios there. And artists who do the residency in Lagos also have the option to either spend a weekend or just make work um, you know, on the farm. And uh, we also want to contribute to local food sustainability. So we grow different crops. And so that's one of our greenhouses. And we sell those locally. And this is some of our crops, peppers. Um, because I didn't want to just create a project that didn't engage with the community directly. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, go to the next one. While you're yes, speaking sir. about that, I'd like to ask you, your work is so full with some level and sense of seduction, I think. And that seduction as a, as a, as a material or as a tool to, you know, uh, bring people into a level of uh, maybe indulgement of beauty, but at the same time, the work is so underlaid with with uh, with drama and with with violence and darkness. And uh, uh, I think I I I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Vietnamese artist Tiffany Chung. Tiffany is. Uh, an incredible artist also who uses multiple material materials to to tell stories of uh, you know the aftermath of uh, of colonialism in ways that uh, is extremely seductive i mean uh, your both your practice are very similar to me in ways that uh, you address so important in uh, uh, thematics, but in a such a beautiful manner that once very easily, you know, indulges in the beauty and, and succumbs to the seduction. So I like the tension that you build between seduc seduction and violence, so to speak. No, I mean, I think that's kind of well, uh, well observed. And I think you know, there's a lot of kind of darkness in the legacy of colonialism. We know that it's a legacy of violence. We know, uh, we know it's it's, it's um, trauma. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's it's we're still as Africans, we're still traumatized. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that um, trauma is a very difficult thing to to recover from. You know, you you do that through through some kind of, um, through healing, mm -hmm. through healing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so maybe the drive towards aesthetics is a process of healing, maybe. I think it's possibly a process of healing, but acknowledging that uh, there is a trauma that needs to be explored. 
you call it you call it trauma we everyone has a, a different way of call i call it grief so to speak or okay. or durational digestion so sort of something that is blotting you even though you know you 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 didn't necessarily you were not at the exact table where this odd food was served but mm. you you inherited it from generation to generation um I think that I would like to close with uh, with something that um, is uh, is of importance to me and to everybody. You have mm -hmm. been uh, celebrated wor worldwide in uh, in many ways, and of course also in your country of residence. You you started getting these uh, incredible honors uh, of uh, of the British Empire. <laughs> And uh, um, starting with, I think it starts with the officer of the OBE and then MBE, and now you are CBE. But I have a small clip that I would like to play. As I speak to you today from Cape Town, I am 6,000 miles from the country where I was born. But I am certainly not 6,000 miles from home. Everywhere I have traveled, in these lovely lands of South Africa and Rhodesia, my parents, my sister and I, have been taken to the heart of their people and made to feel that we are just as much at home here as if we had lived among them all our lives. That is the great privilege belonging to our place in the worldwide Commonwealth, that there are homes ready to welcome us in every continent so, it's all about her these days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I started seeing uh, these honors, you are not the only one. There are many other brilliant brothers and sisters who have received these honors. Uh, but particularly you, at some point, I was, I was, I was perplexed, I was uh, curious. I was uh, intrigued, uh, looking at your biography, looking at the content of your work, looking at uh, you know your stand, looking at uh, everything that you have done and expressed in a such articulated way, not only in your art but also in your eloquent kind of uh, expression about uh, about this history about this relationship with uh, with Britain or the United Kingdom uh, I was I was very surprised that you you accept those honors and you carry them with so much pride so would you like to speak about that did you say you were perplexed or? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well you've answered the question haven't you no, I don't think, I don't, oh, I've answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to know what, yeah. what that means for you. Well, I mean, I think that um, there, are, there are two ways of doing, uh, of doing emancipation. The, the, and both ways, by the way, are actually legitimate and they're, they're absolutely fine. There is the emancipation from the outside and there's emancipation from the inside. And so my brothers and sisters who choose to emancipate from the outside, I applaud them. And those of us who choose to be like the Trojan horse, and emancipate from the inside is also something to be applauded. So my, my choice is to emancipate from the inside. I don't know if that makes any sense. That makes full sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that we have to uh, address our the community of uh, followers who are following the talk online. I would like to now thank you so much, Hinka, for your insight and for your candor, actually. And uh, I would like to open to a few questions or comments or 
whatever you have to say, it's a, it's a free floor. There is a microphone that will be circulating and uh, we are happy to take uh, some uh, questions. Don't be shy. Yes, there is someone here. Great. Oops. Hello, Inka, and hello, um, uh, choir. Um, thank you very much for creating the space for being here today. Um, as a young artist, I really was looking at a lot of your work, Inka, and of course, you came to speak at the art school and got to know your work as well. So um, I guess the question that I have today, also as, a, as an artist who's, um, who was uh, in a show that you curated at the Royal Ac Art Academy. Oh, um, congratulations to you, <laughs> for you in that show. Thank you, yes, the, okay. one, the one that was last year, right? Yes, yeah, yes. that's right, yeah. Um, so it's, it, that, was, that was quite an honor, and thank you for that. Um, my question, I guess, is like for someone who's at your level and you are having all these spaces, um, you, you have your studio practice as well as uh, um, the invitations to do all these talks and the projects that you do, Lagos, which I didn't know, that's an incredible project. Um, and, and yeah, like how do, you, how do you find time and space to manage all of the all of the things, as well as rest and uh, and make work. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, and it takes a very long time to know how to manage many things simultaneously. But you know, when I first started my career, I was a bit of a control freak. You know, I had to do everything myself. I didn't want to trust anyone uh, to do anything. Uh, but, you know, over time, you, you actually learn the art of delegating. And so you have to be a manager. You have to know how to, get, you know, how to juggle so many things. Uh, but it's not something that comes in a day, because most of us want to control every single aspect. But you realize that actually, if you assemble a good team over the years, which I've managed to do, um, you learn to trust people and you learn that actually, you know, things will, will go well if you trust people, they can do it. And you don't need to micromanage as well because that's just a disaster. <laughs> you know, you have to give people space to be, you know, within your team, people have to feel that they can be creative and actually make some creative decisions and then own the project as well. So you have to give some space to people and trust them. Well, you get the rest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You actually realize that, uh, I think this is a question that is valid for everyone who really uh, uh, runs larger operations. You actually realize that by trusting people more and by giving people room to be and to take ownership, as Yinka says, you do much more yeah. than trying yeah. to hold it, right? you achieve much more by giving more room to others, basically. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much for an extraordinary conversation, which really highlights the fact that our history is layers. Even you had very separate layers. In fact, quite a few things just coincidentally over the last couple of weeks have all been about art being used for hearing different voices. For instance, an exhibition of the novel at the moment um, about looking at Greek myths from an African perspective. So again, we're doing all kinds of layers, and I think it's very important to realize that it's not a black and white issue. And I use those two words because they come with their own baggage. So I really think one needs to view things, and I think art, performing, and visual arts are an incredible way of making that statement. And the brilliance with which you do it needs to be applauded. I think it's extraordinary. But the one thing, I find a little perturbing is that we are delving into colonialism, which is over about a four, five hundred year period at least. But what we don't seem to be addressing is the issue we are facing now of globalization. And that is at an exponential rate. 
And what we're looking at, which I'm fearful of, is linguicide. That we're going to be left with three or four languages, perhaps. And with each language comes a culture. And that might be destroyed if we don't do something about it pretty fast. I don't know if that's a concern of yours. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I think, you know, on the issue of globalization itself, I think that, for example, the, the whole kind of pandemic <coughs> issue is actually forced, the pandemic and the environmental uh, disaster that we're in. I think those, those two things, they've been kind of forcing us to, to think global, but to act local, you know, to actually start to, to look at what's in our immediate surroundings. And if we, I mean, if the environment is going to survive, we're going to have to start thinking in that. I mean, that's the purpose of the farm, actually, in Nigeria, is to actually produce food near people to get, you know, so that people can actually participate and appreciate what they have near them and that not everything has to be imported in and brought in. And I think that, you know, to survive, we do have to start thinking very seriously about, uh, about the issues that you mentioned. And I think particularly around the kind of, you know, environmental sustainability, the, the sustain, so sustainability of culture itself as well. Uh, but I don't think that it's entirely helpful to be too parochial either. You know, because we do need others to, I mean, imagine that we didn't share the vaccination. We just, you know, kept it for ourselves and we didn't share it with other parts of the world. I mean, what kind of world are we going to have? You know, so I think it's a question of balance because ignorance is also not great. I would say, yeah. yes, I would like to respond that I think there is a there is a sense or an idea that is uh, sort of uh, being instilled and installed in people's minds that globali globalization is kind of a, a recent contemporary phenomenon. No, it's not. At least I think I would place globalize if there needs to be put a marker, it could be already in the 1500s. Globalization started when Europeans started conquering the world, started appropriating the world, started occupying the world, started navigating across the waters to take lands of other people. That's when globalization started. I think that it has developed uh, to, to, uh, to its most maybe uh, vicious form that we live today. But it's not a new phenomenon. It's nothing new. It's old as any other imperialistic kind of uh, enterprises that humanity has, uh, has developed in terms of uh, subjugating others and occupying <coughs> others. So uh, that's one. Uh, uh, second is also that uh, in terms of what I think is you know, damaging or pollution in terms of environment, I think we have to speak about proportions. Proportions are important to understand where and what and who is damaging the world more than the others. And we know where that is and we know from which kind of culture that comes from. We know from which kind of ideologies that come from the, the modernist capitalist ideology that has developed, you know, uh, uh, the world to where we are, uh, we are at today. So I think sometimes it's a little bit too, too uh, limiting, I would say, to suggest that everybody is in the same boat. That is so not true. We are not in the same boat. The pandemic showed it again, that we are not in the same boat, that lots of people absolutely didn't have the privileges or that others can afford. So I believe that that is important to really put things in perspective and to really put things really in proportions. 
uh, people have to take responsibility for what they did, be it now or in the past, and how it affects the future. So uh, I think I think it's important to uh, to clarify as well. But Tracy had a question. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Yanka, how are you doing? Yeah, how are you? All right. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I wanted to ask you two questions. Um, the first one was the Trojan horse. Um, what have you done as a Trojan horse within that system? Um, and then the second one was just something I, I just want clarity on, I guess, which would probably lead to, lead to, the, lead, you know, lead to um, which is now when you just spoke about the pandemic and you said, what if we hadn't shared, sorry, we hadn't shared the vaccine? And I was quite curious as to who the we is that you're referring to. Um, yeah. So th that'll lead me to my second question. <laughs> I'm the end of it. Okay. Um, so the first one about the Trojan horse. See, there's quite a difference between, uh, you know, showing within an institution or bombing the institution, right? So those are two th different things. So on the one hand, you can, you can participate in an existing system, but then you, protest, you make your protest or your thoughts within an established system. So, you're, so in a way, you go in in disguise, uh, and then you... How, how does that manifest itself? Like, what is, what is it, what, what, like, I wanna, like, I wanna, like, no, like, you know, because the Trojan horse, you know, it was built, there were soldiers inside, they moved in, Exactly. Nightfall, they kind of came out. Like, what are you doing uh, uh, after nightfall? How you, you know, like, yeah, how no, are you managing the situation? No, no, but you've explained, you've actually explained this. Yeah, yeah, structure. but I want to know what you did. <laughs> no, no, but you've explained it. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, but you're saying you're the Trojan horse, but what I'm saying is that, so you were in the system, so how did you disrupt it? Because I want to know at what point, um, because I, I'm still like Hoya, I'm, I'm still deeply perturbed by, by the range of, uh, of acceptances, you know, of, of these OBEs, of these, but whatever they, you know, this, this, these list of, of, from the colonial body, you know, um, and how that, how, how that, that, that act evolutionizes, you know, how, how, do, how do we benefit from these Trojan horses? Well, where's our liberation that all of you brothers in the echelons have now given us, you know, I, you know, and it's not just about the work because you'd still make great work without that accolade. So what you, in the system, what are you doing to fuck with it, like in it, I, that's what I'm, I'm asking. Okay, so um, your your question is um, it's kind of um, it's legitimate in the sense that you can um, okay. So one aspect that I believe in mm -hmm. uh, very seriously is um, social practice, right? So. It might seem subtle to you, or it, may, it might seem unimportant that actually I build a farm, right? Okay. No, 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 hold on. So that might seem, that might seem, uh, it may not seem a significant contribution, right? No, I, I think it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, the question I want to ask you is that where did the economic power come from to enable me to do those things? I don't know. Okay. So the economic power to enable me to do those things comes from my deliberate intervention in the market system. Okay. So you're selling work yeah. and selling work at a particular price exactly. gives you a particular kind of leverage. Exactly. But is that not, would you not be able to do that without the OB? Without, with, that, that for me is the crux of it. Ah, okay. Yeah, how did, how did the farm get built? Uh, uh, with, okay, with okay. So, um, some people operate by opposites, right? So some people operate by a notion of the binary opposition. Now, a notion of the binary opposition suggests that there is us and there is them. So there is me yeah, fighting against the system, which is them. But a higher ground would be to actually make the binary opposition 
a redundant proposition. Sure, it's all, I totally it's all I hear fantasy. that. No, it's all about <laughs> fantasy. I'm just, I'm, for, 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 I, I still, I'm still not, I'm still not convinced. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but we will have uh, time later also to continue that conversation. There are other yeah. people who would like to speak. There are two people in the back there. Mirembe, maybe you can there in the back, and also here. So we have three or four more people. Um, good morning. So uh, I'll start with a confession. I'm not an artist. Uh, I'm a big admirer of artists because I think there's a freedom that um, other practitioners or, pro or practices don't have. And one of the things that I, for me, it's a great honor to hear you speak. And one of the things that I really admire about artists is the ability to, through practice and through thinking, make something or leave evidence of something. So I guess what I'm interested in is that practice of making, whether it's an object, whether it is a process, whether it's a foundation. And I think through that, I, I, I kind of believe what you're saying is that through that, there's a way in which you can process a trauma, a grief, a happiness, a way of being or understanding. So I'd like you to explicate a little bit more in terms of making. Um, you mean how making can help to um, explore ideas of trauma? Ideas, ideas of trauma, ideas of uh, progress, speculation, ideas of imagination. It's just that process of making that I'm really interested in because that comes through in a lot of what you've said today is that you, you make things. You make products, you make systems, you make foundations, you make ways of being. I think even the previous discussion you've just had now with um, the last question is just, it's making, an, it's making a way of thinking. And for me, that yeah. is really, really interesting. Well, I mean, I think that um, to, to actually get or to deal with the idea of agency and to avoid paralysis, you have to have action, right? So, and you have to have action and you have to make real interventions. And so, and I think the process of making, it's just, you know, as black people, we've been deprived of agency for centuries. And basically, um, for me, making things, and not just making, making a foundation, for example, that's agency for me. And creating the route to that agency is making certain interventions in the system that then produces that, that power to give that agency, do you understand? But I'm not going to position myself as opposition to the system because that's been done for centuries and it doesn't, it's not confusing, it's not surprising, right? It's, it's just the status quo. So by confusing, and, and having a refusal to place myself in a, predictable, in a predictable opposition to the system, I'm able to actually do more. Mm. And uh, I think there, is, uh, there, is, there are other people here. Tracy, you'll get to talk <laughs> with Yinka on one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Yes, no, by the way, before we speak, I yeah. actually, I see everything that Tracy is actually saying. And I actually, I understand it. And believe me, I've actually been there. Mm -hmm. So I understand your point of view. So some of the things that I'm actually doing, it's almost in deliberate opposition to my own instincts. And, but there is a, there is a, uh, there is a clear, uh, reason for taking the track that I'm taking. And, it's, and I know it's baffling, it's confusing, but that's why I'm doing it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Just a question. You spoke about consensus, and I'll just to hear your view on consensus within the, the art space and, and how it, it's influenced by the, the resources that we have, because we all seem to be competing for the same thing 
based on the economic and the resources, etc., and how that affects the work that comes up there, and whether is it somehow limiting, in a sense, of how one can explore and, and be creative as much as possible. What's your view on that? Um, so I don't want to misunderstand you. Can I have just a bit more clarity on really what you're asking me? So when we talk about the definition of the African clothing, for instance, and, and how we come about, like you make an example of, an, of a pipe, that it's about consensus, and we all agree that's how we want to define it. So when it comes to the art practice and art space, and whether do we have to have that consensus in, in terms of how we engage and we see things around us, uh, taking into consideration that we are competing for the same resources. I mean, we've got one world and also there is economic pressures there and there. How then do we make sure that uh, we have that freedom at the same time being conscious of the fact that they, they need to be some form of consensus? Or are we saying that there shouldn't be any consensus within the art practice space? No, there shouldn't be consensus. I mean, I think that every artist is different, right? And I think people should actually like, I'm not a dictator, for example. You know, I believe in, you know, I actually believe in opposition to my views, right? So I don't, I don't believe that I should then decide that there's one way of doing something, right? So I don't believe that, you know, I mean, for example, you know, to take, you know, Tracy, for example, I see her point of view, and I don't want her necessarily to agree with me. You know, if there is a, you know, the point of being an artist or a creative is to be broad-minded enough to understand that there are different points of view, and there are different perspectives. So, consensus actually is the opposite of art. It's not, that's dictatorship. You know, you don't, you don't decide that we all have to agree on one way of doing something. I don't know if that if that speaks to anything that you're saying. I guess you, yeah. the gentleman, is asking because when you referred to that, there is a consensus about the agreeing and not about agreeing that the Dutch works are African and that there is a, a cultural, economic, historical appropriation that went to the product yeah. and make it African now. So I think that. Inca, if I may speak for him for one second, is that he was talking about consensus exactly about that matter, but not necessarily in a general kind of way yeah. of applying consensus on everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? There are two people here. There is a gentleman there. There are lots of people. So I really would like everyone to get to talk. And there is also a, gen a lady here, so please carry on. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Inka. Um, and Can you speak up a little okay. bit? Okay. Thank you so much, Inka, and thank you so much, um, Koyo. It's been a an, an, an very fantastic conversation. So I just want to intervene slightly between the dialogue um, with, with Tracy to say that I think a lot of us are actually imbricated in these grand, uh, you know, oppressive regimes. Um, we exist in this institutions, and in a very real sense, we are complicit in the institutional mechanisms, of course, to a varying degree. And I speak for myself as an arts practitioner who also works, uh, you know, at the university. So the question then becomes, um, to what extent can one exist within a particular institutional framework, ethically and morally? And who really gets to decide if one is maybe being backed, you know, privately by these large corporations, is it still within the realm of the ethical? Does the problem only become when the backing or the, the, the receiving of a particular accolade um, is explicit and, and, and public? Um, and it also speaks to this idea of the environmental disaster that we're being faced with. Yes, there are definitely major players, but in a sense, I believe that all of us are once again imbricated, uh, you know, we're burning fossil fuels, we'll have cars. Um, and this just really speaks to the pervasiveness of capitalism. Um, so I don't really think that it's fair um, for us to, you know, 
not necessarily to say point fingers, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge our own individual culpability without, of course, speaking to the ways in which large corporations um, and the Western regimes are the driving force between the you know, um, for the situation that we're in now. So that's one. And then an, a question to you, Yinka. I'm really fascinated by this idea of paradox. So when one maybe looks historically at African languages, um, and not taking African language as homogenous, but there are instances where vernacular languages code the ambiguous. So people speak in quite riddling and riddled um, you know, speech, what idioms, proverbs, the like. Um, but I find that even that mode of communication needs for the speakers to recognize what is at stake or what's at, sp at, what's at play. So how do you then rely on this idea of paradox without losing what I consider to be some sort of grounding message? How are you able to work through allegory and that metaphorical structure, if I can call it that, without losing what's, what's really at stake? Um, you see, I think that there's a difference between, um, between artifice and the didactic. So you can get onto a soapbox and you can, uh, you can give instructions to people I believe that's called fascism. Uh, you can be an artist and you can have a more open-ended um, approach to things. So you can basically, rather than you speaking directly or speaking in a way which is literally. You see, audiences are very sophisticated. And I actually believe that as an artist, there is nothing you've got to say that the audience doesn't already know. So I think sometimes it's better for artists to just shut up. <laughs> um, you know, so I think your best approach is to engage with people in a layered and more complex way. And because actually, in a way, I think that we're, we're poets. We're more like poets or philosophers. We're not. We're not politicians. You know, a politician's job is to kind of give instruction and make laws. Artists are not really in the business of making laws. Artists are in the business of engaging more intelligently with um, a set of propositions. And otherwise, you know, you might as well just give up and just, you know, become a politician. Um, so for me, the richness of um, ambiguity is very important to the process of making and the process of art. Um, yeah, so that's what I, you know, I'm not really in the process of printing newspapers. Yeah. Thank you. That's the gentleman who's been reading since a while, and then the two ladies, and then we should wrap it up. Thank you very much. I like yeah. your pragmatic uh, disruptor. Uh, behavior and your f mix of philosophy and art and environment it's it's to me is it's very rich now my question to you is really you would like to share the vaccines i would see vaccines turn that on its head as the ultimate disruptor of health and happiness and the enslavement of the african continent by the vaccine sars the billionaires who spread disease and problems and that's a construct from outside of Africa, which I don't think belongs here. What are your thoughts? Well, so uh, I don't want you to overfocus on the specificity of vaccines. You know, that's a metaphor for sharing, right? So, um, of course, there are varying views on the vaccine itself, but actually, the conversation is not necessarily about vaccines or the, uh, you know, whether you're for or against. Um, this is more about, you know, Africa 
sharing with the rest of the world and the rest of the world sharing with Africa. So in other words, that was purely a figure of speech. It was a metaphor for sharing. It was not necessarily about the specificity of the corporations behind vaccines or all of the kind of politics behind that very particular thing. Yeah. Um, hi, I, I don't I don't know how um, if Yinka sees it this way, but um, in terms of how I, I look at accepting these awards, I mean, having grown up in the UK at some part of my childhood and being constantly told to go back to my country, um, and even to the point of 16 being given a home affairs letter saying go back to your country um, because because I'm half Filipino, but. Um, they had got some of the data wrong and didn't realize I'd actually been born there and everything. But um, it was a common thing for people to be told that they didn't belong, even if they were from the Commonwealth, that they'd come from other places and been born in, in the UK. So, so there's an invisibility already of, of being allowed to belong. And then on top of that, even in art school, when I was, I was in the Caribbean as, earlier as a, as a teenager, I was creating, wanted to create carnival costume type paintings. They said, no, that's not art. Right, and so there's a, there's a kind of invi that invisibility was something that one had to live with. That somehow you're not significant in the country. And to me, to be able to go through the country and then claim the awards that actually the people of the Commonwealth and beyond the whole, you know, Africa has contributed to that empire. To be able to say, here I am, I'm visible, the same way as all these immigrants who've actually created um, this British Library as such. You know, this. That this this is it's a full city that the UK is just these the the Anglo-Saxon people who live there. It's actually created the whole of the Commonwealth and the British Empire was created by everybody else. So to me, he's just claiming that award that was that really was his in the first place. You know, it's like here I am, I'm visible, and this is this I'm the person who's meant to be here in terms of this what this empire is. So. For me, that's an, a real achievement to say, this is actually ours, and it's not one little group of people that think it's theirs. Does, does that make sense? So that's, that's what I feel, to me, that's the, great, the greatness of being able to stand there and say, this is the work that I'm creating that is kind of in your face, and at the same time claiming my right to be represented as somebody who has actually created what this empire is in terms of the history I come from. Um, but the other quick question I actually really want to say was, was just, uh, there's this cult of the lone artist, and I don't know how much the art schools still do this, but you know, there, to what extent should artists possibly be educated? Because you know, yes, it is every artist individual, but we all go through the system. Um, to, be, to be socially responsible as well, to think you know, beyond this, I'm going to be the gallery artist and make tons of money, um, to actually think I'm part of a, a culture and a community? Well, first of all, I, I, would, um, I would advise you to make tons of money. <laughs> it's, you know, that's absolutely necessary. So don't buy the myth of, um, you know, um, the poor artists. You know, it's not very interesting. And you know, secondly, um, I actually like this conversation about um, me accepting the CV or not accepting the CV. I think actually the main reason for accepting it is because of this. You know, um, I think that if I, if I hadn't accepted it, I would have just done what many other people have done and it would never be spoken of again. So, you know, I like the, the kind of tension it's created. Well, it creates and, um, the tension anyway, Inka. I mean, if you would have um, rejected it, we could have been talking about why you rejected it. So we are talking now why you accepted it. So it it's comes down to the same, actually. Yes, it's very interesting. But you see many, many more people who've rejected it that I know of. It's never really been spoken of again. So I think it's to actually throw everyone into confusion. It's, it's more interesting. <laughs> I think we have another, we take, 
We take two more questions or three more and that's it. So Charlotte and the gentleman over there and a gentleman over there and that's it, please. Thank you so much, Koyo. Uh, Yinka, it's good to have you back on African soil for a change. Um, my comment is about um, Dutch wax prints. And whenever I hear them discussed in relationship to your practice, I feel that there's a missing narrative. And that's the narrative of economic history and women's economic history, particularly in West Africa, where, as you know, um, most of the traders um, of Dutch, Dutch wax prints are women. Most of the fashion designers, many of them are women. And it's just a comment that I think, you know, when you talk about the Dutch, Dutch wax prints in relationship to your practice and how um, they're symbolic of colonialism, um, I think there are also other narratives that can come out of that experience, um, particularly one of women. Um, what I'm wearing today is the product of many women, uh, some of whom have been able to buy houses, put their children to, through school because they're engaged in this trade. And in fact, there are local manufacturers in West Africa that produce these textiles. There's a huge archive in Akosombo in Ghana, which was um, a textile mill that was established by Kwame Nkrumah in the 1960s. And their archive contains designs that were made by Ghanaians. They weren't made by um, Blisco. Um, so there's another narrative there. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's why, you know, I kind of said earlier that if Africans say that they're African, then they are African. And Africans can, can you know, create textile mills and create, you know, I keep talking about agency and economic emancipation. And what you say about the women, for me, it's, that's an example of agency and actually taking control and making your own economic emancipation and through your own design and your own skills. Yes, okay, they may have been inspired by Indonesian uh, in the textiles, but, but it doesn't make them nevertheless illegitimate. You know, if, if the women take ownership of those fabrics and if they create their own economic emancipation through making them, then they are making their own, you know, their own version. Because why is it then that when Westerners appropriate something from Africa, that seems okay. But when Africans ap appropriate something, then it's considered kind of derivative or whatever. You know, so the, so the women can take ownership of, of what they've done and their own kind of economic, you know, their own economic emancipation that way, you know, yeah. Uh, hi, yes. sorry, yeah. Um, hi, uh, my question is in relation to um, the racial aspect of your work, if that's okay. Um, you stated or mentioned earlier how you did not want to be um, subservient to the system, um, and um, so I'm spacing out for a second. Um, uh, yeah, basically, my question is um, how, how or why is it, um, as stated earlier, there's a certain seduction or eloquence to um, the way that racial um, injustice uh, contrast and all is um, presented in your work. So I was just wondering if is there a, a certain, so I have the understanding that um, as you said, um, your work is not to um, create any sort of uh, racial revolution or Pro or anything in that case, but is there any sort of message, um, emotion, or level of introspection that you kind of expect from both your uh, white viewers as well as your black viewers from your art? I, I hope that makes sense. Sorry. Um, I mean, I think that. For me, I think the revolution happens in the conversation that people are having about what you've presented, right? So I think that the work itself 
the work in itself for me is not necessarily going to change anything, right? But, but the work can be a catalyst for change, if that makes any sense. So it can be, it can be, it can create a platform for debate. Um, it can also create, uh, you know, substantial, substantial, you know, economic power to do things. But the work itself cannot um, change things, but the residue of the work or the impact of the work can create debates and can create conversation, which can then lead to other things. So, so in a sense, it's a catalyst in that way. Yeah. Um, sorry, just Who to. Stuff back, right? <laughs> See the Trojan horse that's gone in to go and collect that shit from the empire. <laughs> that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> can only be it. That can only be it. So I'll accept nothing less. <laughs> well, I think that. Um, in a way, your response is the appropriate response to to the work and to the debate. No, 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 action, Silas, action. Dinosaur. The work is the action, Tracy. You know that very well. Um, this, there is one per last person here, and then we are closing. Thank, thank you very much. It's a very interesting conversation and discussion to follow. Um, um, I didn't expect it in an art, in a in a in an art show or in an art conversation to come to a very hard um, arguments for and against, you know what we've just chatted about. My question to you was, and both of you, Koyo and Yinka, was that you're challenging a system that has been given to you or to us, and. Um, but you've actually gone through the system yourselves. So you, <clears throat> you both studied at universities in Europe. Uh, Koya, you even have a Swiss husband. Um, you, 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 so you, what? You, you, <laughs> <laughs> you, work, uh, you work for Zeitz, which is a, a German name. Um, so, you know, the question is really, I think you studied in Switzerland as well. Yes. So, the question is, you know, you went through, and I think it's, it's come out through a previous um, speaker as well, question as well, is you, you actually went through the pipeline, uh, and you, you've gone through it, and you're actually challenging that, that, that exact system that you went through. And it must create a lot of tension in, in, your, in, in your own work and in, in, your, you know, in your being. And how, basically, how do you deal with it? You, you, you almost say, if I want to become the president of South Africa, I have to be become a, um, a member of the ANC, right? So change South Africa. Now, it's a very similar you know, concept that you've had to go through or are going through to be able to change the system or become the Trojan horse. Uh, you're actually going through a system that's laid out by the West. I don't know how you feel about this question, Yinka. I'm a bit disturbed <laughs> by it in many ways because, uh, you know, referring to my Swiss husband or referring to my affiliation to Zeitz Moka and trying to paint it in contradiction to my political views or my, you know, uh, uh, positions around uh, the complexities of uh, colonial history is a bit problematic. Uh, it's problematic in as much that I think that uh, we all have to be aware of systems and the workings of systems and separate systems to individuals. So uh, me being married to a Swiss man does not prevent me from being critical to the colonial system and to the white system. And uh, uh, and I, I actually I don't think you understood my my my, 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 my but question. But you are alluding to it, so allow me to answer. So uh, and I kind of uh, I kind of believe that. 
uh, and this is somewhat also actually what what Yinka is saying about his position and his his uh, his uh, yeah his position and his views. Uh, you can be within a system, and you can be and not necessarily being part of it, which is not uh, his case. You can, be, you can be associated to something and not necessarily being representative of it. So, uh, so, and, and so that's beyond where my question is yeah. exactly there yeah. at that point, is does that create tension? Mm. Does that create tension within you? No. Oh. I sleep very well. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no problem with it. Me being married to a Swiss man just shows that I'm not racist, basically, no, I, I, to a certain extent. So I, I think, I think that, you know, that's my, I'm also not married to a, a person of my, my color, but I think <clears throat> that doesn't have anything to do with racism. You know, as, as, as you might have noticed in your relationship, and this is not very personal, is you don't see the other person's color anymore. The but that's what I'm trying to tell you. You keep alluding it to the personal. I think the personal can become political, and one can read a lot through, you know, a personal, but I think that it's very important to make a difference between that personal kind of choices and positions that are informed by circumstances, that are informed by many things that are not necessarily public, uh, and that to, de to, to, to really separate it from looking at the system, understanding, critiquing a system, or participating or not participating in a system. So uh, I agree with, uh, with Yinka what he said about, and, uh, about his um, acceptance of, uh, of the British highest accolades in terms of uh, participation in a society, as much as also I agree with my position of being critical of it, you know. So, and I think that is exactly the kind of tension that make conversations interesting, and not about taking stances of yes or no. It is the, 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 the murky, messy space between the yes or no that is interesting, I think. The question I would like to ask the gentleman is, um, you know, for, well, first of all, I have to say that I love the tension between these debates to, today. I think it's probably one of the best talks I've been to, you know, because I think it's very important that people don't have the same point of view. So it shows intelligence in the audience. You know, so that, first of all, that's the first thing I have to say that that's actually brilliant. I don't want people to agree with me i mean what point will that be and you know so and i think that and then i just finish with by asking you the gentleman the question have you tried living outside of the system uh, when, when you say which which system are you talking about any system you know the system the way that our society is structured you know the money system uh the, the political system, your responsibility as a, system, as a taxpayer, um, your responsibility to others without violence on other people. I'd love Have to you live tried living outside of the system? Yeah, so, so I, I'm actually um, not South African. So I'm living in a system that I'm not, I didn't, I wasn't born into. No, you don't, you are, you're not answering my question, right? So, I'm, so I'm, 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 you, I'm, you're sitting, you're sitting there, right? Understanding your boundaries, okay? You're not going around um, slapping everyone around you. You know, you're sitting there, understanding the structure, right, of how society operates. So, have you tried living outside of the system? Are you saying the monetary system or the tax system? I mean, Everything. I, I, I do. I, I, st I would love to live without paying tax no, no. <laughs> and i'd love to um, <laughs> i think you're you're i think you're funny 
That's the I'm least we say, can say. Just, I'm, I, I'm actually German, yeah. and this is the first time ever that I was told that I'm funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> normally we don't uh, get told that we're funny. Um, but I, I, when you, I, I don't understand well, your question. Are you saying out of my political system? Because I'm, you, you, you're obviously looking at me as a white man, and you're saying, wait, you must be one of the other guys that came, and now he's talking. You know. Or are, are you don't saying, make assumptions. You keep making assumptions well, I'm, I'm that are disturbing. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand when you when you say have I lived you know, have I lived in another system? What do you mean by that? Okay, look, I'm not going to prolong this unnecessarily. Exactly. But I just, I think that there is a fallacy of um, a, a place that is outside of the system existing. Such a place does not exist. You know, that's all I'm just going to say. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inka. Thank you all for coming on a Saturday morning, midday. Thank you for all of you who are following online, and thank you for the members of Zeitzmoka, for whom this event was also curated, and uh, follow us on the media for our future programs.